will, will change us as we <laughs> go on. Uh, it is uh, six or one. So let's be right with the schedule. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining the third uh, Data Science uh, Serbia webinar that we are hosting. Uh, today, I have a special honor to present Theophilos Kakantusis, uh, data engineer and co-founder of Logical Clocks. Uh, he will be also our speaker, so that's also the reason why we, the whole session will be in English, since we have an international speaker. And I just want to, to invite you to follow all, the, all of our meetups, uh, follow us on uh, all the media that we have there for the information, because we're trying to push all of these meet up, meetups to have them every week to see some, it's some hot topic like we have uh, today. So feel free to write us if you have any ideas or suggestion, suggestions how we can improve this or how we can be better and how to, to actually deliver uh, more more the, the content of the or better quality and how to improve ourselves. And uh, I won't uh, spend a lot of time introducing. I just want to hand over to Theo and he will present himself. Uh, himself. And during the session, please feel free to use the QA session and the chat to post your questions that, that you have. And we'll we'll answer them to to the, as the session goes on. I will uh, I will ask the questions and and Tao will will respond. So I will now stop sharing the screen and Tao will will respond. Yeah, so hello everyone. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, so uh, thank you for having me on the on the meetup. Uh, my name is uh, Theophilus and I'm a co-founder of Logical Clocks, a company based in Stockholm. I will explain later on a bit. And we're here today to talk mostly about the feature store, the concept of the feature store, which is a, a very emerging and hot topic these days uh, in the data engineering, data science domains. So the company, as I said, is uh, spread <laughs> around, especially now with the COVID situation. Uh, but most of us, uh, most of the team is based in Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, we have been working on the platform on Hopsworks and the feature store for a few years now. And we have uh, mostly, uh, we come from research and we have a strong research ba uh, background, which we put into uh, this uh, company, which is a startup, it's VC back. So our research comes mostly from KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And this is a part of the, of the team that you can see. So Hopsrox and the feature store, everything is uh, open source. So the product and everything is open source, so you can use it for free. You can download it, uh, have a go at it. And I will explain later on uh, about the feature store and everything. Now, the, the feature store and Hopsrox, we have won uh, some awards for it from IEEE for performance of the file system, data science awards, uh, and all that. Now about use cases, which is more interesting, we focus on some verticals. Now, uh, one big one is finance. Uh, we're working with one of the largest banks in Scandinavia. And uh, healthcare, Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, a very busy place these days, unfortunately. And they're using big data to do genomics, uh, genomic analysis and all that by using uh, the Hopsworks platform and the feature store. And other uh, like automotive or telco. Also lately, we have been pushing a lot uh, the cloud uh, transformation. So we already have some uh, wins there uh, about the feature store in the cloud, which is on AWS right now. But the entire platform, the open source one, you can install it also on GCP or Azure if you like. Now, uh, as we said before, we're here mostly, and I guess most of you are interested in talking, uh, in getting to know a bit more about what is this feature store? Why, why is it so trendy these days? So typically, uh, the journey of uh, a company of an organization which, that wants to do some data science would start from uh, collecting uh, the data, uh, pre-processing, doing some feature engineering, and we will explain later on a bit about that, and then, training some machine learning models uh, with deep learning perhaps and then putting these models into production now the first step into this journey uh, like the most basic one would be to have some ad hoc scripts uh, maybe some scripts that convert data that collect and pre-process the data that would be uh, maybe uh, used uh, like as jobs maybe you can schedule them periodically so you would have these in an organization 
and that would work well. But then the next step would be to actually share these jobs that create the, the, feature, the feature data, share them across different departments of the organization, share it securely and share it and do fine grain access control also. But you don't want to share all the jobs with all the departments, okay? The next step is not only to manage the actual uh, compute the, the jobs, but you want to manage also the feature data that is to be used by data scientists, for example, to train the models. And uh, you may have their offline data, that is uh, data to be used in batch, so in big, like terabytes, petabytes even, depends on the size of the organization, or online data, which is data used by online real-time applications, where you want to fetch your data and use them to predict something by using a model. So assuming you have all that, the last step would be to combine all that and to try to automate it and uh, do something that these days has been labeled as ML ops. So that means that you have your feature store, you have your feature data, you have your model repository where you uh, push your developed models and then you can also manage your provenance, your serving and the jobs that do, that create the feature data and everything. Now there are some known feature stores in production. So the whole uh, concept, let's say, uh, was triggered maybe by Uber's Michelangelo a few years ago. Uh, and we see here based on this list that a lot of the, let's call them hyperscale companies, such as Uber, and Airbnb, and Netflix, they have implemented their own flavor, let's say, of a feature store. Uh, but most of the companies, most of the organizations or users do not have the capacity to develop their own, of course, and they don't need to. I mean, they want to use something that is already there, plug it in, and then uh, use it to, for whatever other uh, reasons they want in, to, to train models, etc. So, uh, yeah, the big ones have their own, but Hopsworks and the Feature Store is something that is open source and you can use it, and there are some other ones out there. If you want to learn more, there's a link at the bottom, featurestore.org, where you can go through uh, most of these. Now, uh, we can start by taking a data engineer's perspective on what feature engineering is. And we have this, let's say, gap here on the left. We have data that the feature, uh, that data engineer would mostly work with uh, or platforms that they would work with. For example, data engineer would work mostly with relational databases uh, or data lakes, and they would use structured data with schemas or maybe unstructured data and work a lot with uh, Varkar data types, not necessarily just numbers, uh, mostly characters or strings, etc. Now, on the other side, a data scientist would mostly expect numbers. They want to have data in uh, numerical data that they can use to feed into their training algorithms to develop the model, the machine learning model. So now there is a gap here where data engineers and data scientists need to work on the same data, but in different forms, let's say. And the feature store, let's say, brings an API here that kind of bridges the gap between the data engineering on the left and the data science on the right. Now, to give a more concrete example, uh, we have a table here, we can call it like a data frame. And we see that we have two columns, ID and features. Now the features are already numerical, but the data scientist would say here, ah, the last row, uh, the last row here has a wider spread of values than the other rows. So what they most likely want to do before training the model would be to squash the values between a certain range, a shorter, uh, like a smaller range. So in this case, you would transform this uh, data frame, let's call it, and into uh, 0.5 and uh, minus 0.5 uh, range. So it, to avoid any data uh, numerical inconsistency later on in training. So uh, this is an example of how would you would do that with code. In this particular like short example, uh, we're using PySpark, and uh, and uh, which is a very it's based on Apache Spark, a very popular distributed processing framework. And here you uh, use an already existing normalizer function in PySpark uh, to do that in Python. So you read the data, you normalize it, and then, so you apply the normalization, you get a new colon, L1 underscore norm, and then that's it. Also, you can drop the features colon after you do the transformation in order to have some uh, cleaner data 
later on in training to avoid any confusion that the data scientist might end up with. Another motivation for uh, the feature store is the following. You may be using pre-trained models. Uh, for example, for natural uh, language processing, you may be using BERT, which is a very popular uh, model developed with uh, deep, uh, deep learning, uh, with the deep neural networks. So you may have the same model in an organization, but you may have different departments that need to process and engineer their features before feeding them into the model uh, if they want to use it later on. So you may have analytics or legal or customer, different departments. So this is duplicated work. What ideally you would want to have is a place where the feature data uh, is stored and computed at the same place and then the data scientist can extract the data from this um, one, uh, let's say the ground truth uh, layer. Another issue uh, which the feature store tries to solve is when you have a training pipeline at the top, the, let's call it a step, the training step at the top, you have features and labels and you produce a model. Now to do that, you would usually use some uh, machine learning framework and namely PyTorch, uh, Scikit-Learn or TensorFlow. These are the most popular ones, but you may have some other ones. Now, this is the, typically the work of the data scientist, let's say. Now, at the bottom, we see that um, inference, that means when you have the features in the model and you want to actually use the model to, let's say, make a prediction, you have different applications that construct the feature vector, let's say. They send it for inference to the model and they get back an answer, prediction or classification. Uh, so this application can be developed in different frameworks. It could be Java, Python, or whatever. The problem here is that how would you ensure consistency between the features that have been developed during training and between the features that have been developed during inference? Ideally, you would like to have one place where the features are computed and stored once and you reuse them for both stages. And this is where the feature store, for example, can fit in. You put the data, you engineer them, you have them in the feature store, and then you can get them both in training and inference. So let's talk about <coughs> a bit about the feature store concepts now and abstractions. Uh, we see the most basic one uh, is the feature itself. So the feature, uh, we can imagine um, uh, it is really the attribute that you want to use for training and all that. And ideally you would want to share these features across an organization. You would want to make them available to different pipelines uh, in your company. Then we have the abstraction of the feature group. Now the feature group, we can uh, imagine it as a grouping, as the name suggests, of features. And we're using the data frame API for that. So we could think of it as um, the data frame being uh, a feature group and the feature being a column in the data frame. In this example, we have the Titanic passenger list feature group and the passenger bank account uh, feature group. And each has a name, they have like name, passenger class, the sex, and they survive, if they will survive or not, this is the, if they survived or not, this is the feature. Now here, what we want to do, what the data scientist would like to do, is to join these different feature groups and predict if a passenger survived or not, because the intuition here is the more money a passenger had in their bank account, the, li the more likely it was that they survived the, the wreck, the, the shipwreck. That is because maybe they bribed to get on a boat or they got um, a cabin that was closer to the lifeboat or something like this. Now, to do that, it would be a bit tedious for the data scientist to go and discover where these features are in a database or somewhere in some file and then join them. But the feature group, uh, really, the feature store uh, provides these abstractions so the data scientist can then go with a very uh, easy API or from the user interface, we can solve it in the demo, and then join these two feature groups and create a train or test data set. So I, in the end, the data scientist would want to uh, create a train or test data set to train and validate the model. So in this case, they join by name and they say, oh, okay, I want to create a train and test data set and the platform itself will, and we will explain later on, find the common uh, key to join and we'll create the training data set that you see at the top. Now, 
the training data set, what is it exactly? I mean, we have the training data set, but how can you use it? You can persist it in a, uh, on the feature store will provide you uh, APIs for this, persist it in a file format of your choice, and uh, that you can, that the data scientist will use uh, when doing the training. So if they're using TensorFlow, they will go with TF record probably, uh, PyTorch, maybe NumPy, etc. Or Petastorm, which is a, a popular file format developed by Uber for, um, for machine learning. And then you have your file format and you want to persist it somewhere. So the feature store provides you with connectors so you can persist it uh, in the file system that is shipped with uh, Hopsource itself with the feature store in the platform or in the cloud, you can use uh, uh, S3 buckets on Amazon or uh, in Google Cloud. So it's very easy to create a connector and then use it to persist the train or test data set. Now an important uh, thing to mention here is that all these uh, features, feature groups, and train test data sets are all versioned uh, because it is important that you can, as a, from a data scientist, that you can uh, version and have different versions from different experiments and all that. Now, um, an important uh, issue when ingesting data into the feature store can be that uh, data comes in different uh, intervals, let's say, cadences. So you have data that comes uh, more frequently than other types of data, also different types of data. So we have real-time data, we can have uh, event data, maybe from sensors, we can have data from uh, SQL or a data warehouse, or even data that is more infrequently accessed, for example, on S3 or some HDFS data lake or something like this. Now let's put some number, numbers on that. So for real time, you're looking into real time feature transformations uh, in a sub-second uh, range, let's say. So you may have a form on a website. So the user fills in a form and then they submit the form. So you want to, uh, you want to process this uh, form and make it available later on to, you want to extract the data from the feature store and then submit this data to the model for prediction or something like this. Now, event data can be a bit later. Uh, the interval is a bit bigger. It can be like every five seconds or more, uh, typically from streaming applications, like click events from websites. Or uh, one that is very important is uh, when you have CDC, like change data capture. So you have data that is changed on some other platform, maybe a database, or maybe you're using a streaming um, log, a distributed log like Kafka or something. So you get data from different services and then you stream the data changes all the way into the feature store, which then you can use to develop the, the model and everything. Also here for the SQL Data Warehouse example, you can have a Pandas application that updates a user profile maybe once an hour, uh, their last login, for example, or something like this. And the other one, the batch applications which handle a lot of data, but they run more infrequently. It can be once a day when they want to collect statistics from a web log, for example. Now, the interesting part here is that although you have different uh, ingestion rates from different types of data, ideally you want to have one feature. So you want to have one place to manage the data and to ingest and also access. In this case, uh, we can see that the real-time data, for example, can be used by an online application and it consumes the real-time data and pushes that into the feature store. But you can also have uh, use cases, for example, an application that gets a lot of data, not uh, in real time, but huge volumes of data from the feature store in order to do training, to train a, a new model or to use the, the model for some batch inference with uh, large volumes of data. Now, this online application usually would want to do that in uh, milliseconds. So let's say then less than 10 milliseconds, they want to get the features, the feature vector for a particular, uh, let's say, user that submitted the form and then send it to the model. But then within the same feature store, you would like to have terabytes or petabytes of data, but you don't have so strict uh, latency requirements. Now, from a technology point of view, uh, it's not easy or we, we haven't found a database that can do both uh, equally well. So what 
we are doing is we use the feature store with two different technologies in the back end with and we call it online feature store and offline feature store so online is the place where the data is ingested and accessed for online applications that need let's say millisecond latency but offline is the one for uh, doing training in large volumes of data or for batch uh, applications that want to do inference the main idea though here however is that you would like to have one interface to push data from all these different kinds of applications you don't want to uh, push this uh, burden to the application layer to the data scientist let's say or data engineer in this case actually uh, they would not have to deal with uh, how to maintain this consistency and that is what the face of is doing here and um, we do that by using the data frame api so all our apis uh, java and um, sorry scala and uh, python they use the data frame api so you can do your actual feature engineering in uh, uh, different platforms such as spark streaming uh, or just uh, spark and for bats, uh, for the web logs uh, use case, or in Python for the pandas use case. Uh, and then you can insert, you can have your data frame and insert it into the feature store. You can even, for the real time use case, you can even uh, work with Flink, which is part of the platform, part of the Hopsource platform. And you can, uh, it provides the same semantics as Spark in terms of uh, how you can manage it from Hopsource. So with a few clicks or API calls, you can just start and stop uh, Spark and Flink clusters. And that is also connected with Kafka. So if you want to do uh, the online application. And we see here that there is only a uh, data frame API that is the entry point to the feature store. And in the feature store, you have the different feature groups. So you have the click feature group for the event data and the user feature group for the data warehouse, etc., or for the logs. Yeah, and this is what, uh, what we just described about the data frame API. Now uh, let's look at some very, very basic code example. How would you register a feature group with a feature store? So let's say that you are working with Python most of the time, most uh, data scientists and data engineers depends. Uh, so you would do from hops import feature store as FS. So you get hold of the feature store library. Then you can work with Spark or Pandas data frame. You initialize it and then you do your feature engineering on the data frame. So you apply your transformations as we saw before in the example. And in the end, what you will do is FS, feature store, create feature group. So it accepts uh, the default uh, like parameters that you uh, have to provide is the data frame itself and the name. In this case, it's the Titanic data frame from the use case we described before. Now, uh, there are some other uh, parameters here that you can set. Uh, there are some defaults for this, but if you want to set them yourself, it would be, for example, the version of the feature group. Uh, if you want to like version one, two, three, it depends on the data engineer or scientist to actually uh, set this depending on their business needs. Um, or for example, you can set if the data is to be inserted into the offline and online feature store. It can be offline, it can be online, or it can be both. So if you have a data frame and you want to have it uh, available, made available both on uh, in real time and in batch, then you can leave, you can set the default to to insert it on, on both. So an overview so far of the feature store is that we have the event for SQL data or from a data lake or in, uh, in the cloud somewhere on an object store and we ingest it into the feature store online and or offline. But we haven't talked so much about the next step, which is fetching data, getting data from the feature store in order to use it with online application applications or batch uh, applications and for model training of course so how would you do that again uh, you would uh, import your, the feature store module from the hops library so this library is a python library and it's available uh, on pip also there is a, a java equivalent of it called, called hops field but in this case we we'll use the python example and you can get the features from the feature store that you need to create your training data set with. So you want to create a training data set and then uh, specify a file format. And then you can use this uh, file format in order to, to call your TensorFlow program in this example. Now, uh, um, you can see here, when you do feature store, get features, you supply the name of the features. So in Hopsworks feature store, there's a flat namespace across 
all uh, across all the feature groups. So you can have um, a scope as well if you have the same feature name in different feature groups. Uh, so here we can see that you have your sample data, you got the, the features from the feature store, and then you call create training data set. You provide the sample data, you provide a name for your training data set. In this case, it is Titanic training data set. The data format, which is TF record, so you would most probably use it with TensorFlow, and the version. So in this case, it's the first version of this uh, training data set. Now, uh, we, this is how you, you would create a training data set. So you train your model. Now, how do you access the online feature store? So in the use case, when you want millisecond latency, when you want to retrieve feature data and make it and build your feature vector in order to give it to, to the model. So here we see an online application and it's made up of two parts. One is a JDBC connector to, sorry, to, the, to the online feature store. And the second one we'll see later on is the predict. So where we are going to actually ask the model for a prediction. Now, what this part does, the first one, is that the online application goes, connects uh, to the online feature store uh, via JDBC. And the online feature store can be on uh, an availability zone in uh, NWS, for example, in this case. And then it asks for the online feature store to give it back a feature vector based on some ID usually. So you have uh, the request here that, for, that is issued by the online application would be, uh -huh, okay, so I have a user that filled in a form. I know the user ID and I want this, uh, the features that are related to this user. For example, you may have Date, uh, features that have been computed and are um, give me the um, the average price of your basket that you have online in your in the web page or if it is a ride sharing application you may have data for example give me the last uh, 20 minutes average trip ride or cost so you want to get this in milliseconds so then you can ask uh, you can uh, send the inference request to the model and then you get an answer back, so the application will send it back to the client. Okay. Now, to go a bit more technical about the choice of uh, technology here, for the online feature store, we use uh, MySQL cluster, NDB, which stands for Network Database. So it is a very fast in-memory relational and transactional database. It can do millions of uh, uh, operations per second. So it is a very good fit for when you want to do uh, Real, real, uh, real fast uh, lookups, key value lookups, for example. Now, in the second part, after you get back the feature vector in the online application, you want to you build your feature, your request, your inference request, and you send it to the model. Now, the model can be either served within Hopsworks, uh, that is, Hopsworks pro uh, provides support for uh, scikit-learn and TensorFlow uh, serving or you can actually extract it, download it, and uh, put it in some other serving infrastructure that you may have in the cloud or on-prem. So also here, the latency is very low. As we can see, it should be about five to 50 milliseconds, depends on the network latency and everything. So here in this example, we see that the model is served in another availability zone uh, in the same uh, region, and we get back the prediction. Now, another important uh, aspect here is that the online feature store is uh, highly available across availability zones in the same region, of course. So that means that you uh, are guaranteed, let's say, uh, that you will get a response even if some availability zone is unavailable, for example. And for the offline feature store, we did not cover that part. We use Apache Hive. So in the back end, we have our own, let's say, flavor uh, of, uh, we have our uh, file system, which is based on HDFS, but it has diverged a lot since then. It's called HopsFS. And on top of that, we have Apache Hive. So this is for the offline one. And for the online, we use this uh, MySQL cluster uh, database. Now, that was mostly the, uh, the feature store. But Hopsworks is a bit more than that. And so the feature store is the main component in the middle, as we can see. But you can do a lot more than that by using also the feature store. And we will also show later on a bit in the demo uh, how you can do that. 
So in the phase of the in general, the, sorry, the hop strokes in general, as, uh, you can ingest data by using uh, Apache Kafka, for example, or Scoop, Apache Scoop from uh, relational databases. So you can get your data in. Then you can use uh, for batch and streaming different distributed processing frameworks, such as Apache Spark, Apache Flink, and uh, Apache Beam. And then you have the feature store as we have uh, been describing uh, so far. And then a lot of uh, open source technologies for actually doing the machine learning part. So data and conda support, there is self-service support for data scientists or engineers, the users of the platform to actually install uh, Python libraries without go having to go from command line or manage how they distribute them. Uh, distributed support for Jupyter and Jupyter Lab, uh, TensorFlow PyTorch, really any Python library that you have, but mostly Hopsrux has a nice uh, integration with TensorFlow and PyTorch. And then for model serving, which is important as we described before. There is support in Hopsworks uh, to run your model serving in Kubernetes, so you can scale it up and down, so you have elasticity depending on how many requests you get, because you don't get the same requests, of course, any time of day or any type of day. Uh, if you have an online store and then it's a sales season or Black Friday or something, uh, then you would like to scale it up and then scale it down when things get calmer. And uh, another important part, uh, is model monitoring. So we use Apache Kafka and Spark streaming for that. Model monitoring means that whenever an inference request is sent to a model that is served within Hopsworks, the request goes through the Hopsworks API. And then we store these requests in Kafka. So we can go back and monitor how your model is being um, performing while serving. Okay, and then you might want to compare different uh, statistics or features with um, the feature data that you have in training. So we can also show it a bit later on. As I said, this sits on top of HopsFS, and the important part here is that all that feature store and all the other, and the file system, they use the same metadata layer. That's quite important to ensure consistency between uh, different feature data and raw data. Uh, Etc. And all this, the entire pipeline can be orchestrated in Hopsworks with uh, Airflow, for example, Apache Airflow. So you can build your pipelines and you can say, I want to run this feature engineering job before training, and then I want another job to trigger the, the serving part. Sorry, Tao, we have one question actually from the, uh, from the audience. So uh, the question is, what are the most important benefits of the feature store? Uh, can you give us some numbers, like how, how it accelerates the process of machine learning? What are the costs for having it and creating it? Mm -hmm. So um, you can, some of the main benefits are reusability of features. So you don't have to, uh, let's go back to the, maybe we can use, yeah, maybe this one. Yeah. Uh, no, let's go forward, okay. I just need to have a nice figure. To, yeah, let's, let's use this one. So um, one reason to use the, for the feature store is the reusability of features, as we said. And you cannot put a number, you, it's difficult to measure that <laughs> with numbers and put a metric on that. But what, me, what that means is how much time would a data scientist spend on re-engine on rewriting maybe the code that computes the feature or how much time they would spend on um, searching for a feature so this is something we will show later on it's very important the discoverability of features uh, we have seen many times people writing blog posts about how long it took them to find in a big data platform to find something like a file or a feature or something an artifact uh, so it's very important that it will reduce your time a lot uh, for discovering features. Uh, now from a, a compute or storage perspective in terms of numbers, that really depends because uh, maybe, uh, yeah, I did not mention it yet, but uh, you can do your storage and compute in Hopsworks or in, an out, in a platform outside. So you can have, for example, your compute, uh, maybe 
in SageMaker or uh, I don't know, yeah, something like this, or uh, Databricks, and then you can have your training in SageMaker, let's say, uh, in AWS. So then it really depends what kind of metric you would use. You would say, ah, okay, this, uh, the feature store would reduce my time to go from ingestion to start the training by X or Y amount. Um, now, if you want some numbers, yes, uh, it's about uh, numbers is mostly things you can put on paper right now. It's mostly about the online serving. So you can say, okay, it takes me that long to get the features from the online feature store, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but well, also, I have also an additional question actually coming from my side now uh, that you mentioned. So for example, in industries, for example, there are difficult problems to, to really and to different social units to agree upon what's churn, for example. So is this maybe also an area where the store can help us? For example, we know, I mean, for once we have determined what is the churn, how do we measure it? And then we have it as a, as a feature in our feature store. And then any part of the organization that wants to use churn as, as a feature for, for their model to use that as, as the input. So is that also an area where we can benefit from feature store or? Exactly, yeah, that's a very good point. So this touches upon the uh, reusability of features, let's say. So you define, someone will define what the churn feature is and then you have it in the feature store and then the feature store will act as the ground truth, let's say. You will not have different interpretations of what this particular feature is. Or, or if you want so, you can create your own new feature <laughs> and then you can name it churn v2 or something and then you can have it in the feature store, but then it's up to the application, up to the users on how they will use the feature store. But yes, uh, the feature store will help also with this. Uh, so you can have a central repo of your uh, feature data. Perfect. Um, any other questions or shall I? Uh, we, we can proceed and then I'll. <laughs> I'll interrupt you a few more times, probably. But, yeah, sure. that's good. That's what I hope for. <laughs> and uh, yeah, good question also from the audience. That was an interesting one. So <clears throat> before we jump into the demo, uh, there's not much left, uh, which is good. So the demo is more interesting. Uh, uh, the last part here is that how would the feature store fit in an end-to-end -end pipeline, let's say. So as we said before, you would have your data warehouse or your uh, streaming ingestion uh, like pipeline with Kafka or a data lake something. And then you do your feature engineering, uh, the compute part and the storage part. And then you have the online and the offline feature store. So this thing here can be done in Hopsource, as we said, or outside of Hopsource. It can be done in some other platform. And then Hopsource can plug in into these platforms like Databricks or SageMaker. So you would have your metadata, let's say, in, uh, in Hopsox, and then you would do your compute and storage somewhere else. Or you can do your storage within Hopsox, but connect it to S3. Then the next step would be feature selection, what we uh, just uh, discussed. Like if you have a feature called churn, and, uh, and then you want to get that feature, and then build a training data set with it, and persist it somewhere in the local file system uh, or distributed file system in S3 or somewhere, or you don't even need to persist it. Maybe you want to go directly to, to do the training. So this part here is typically what we call uh, experimentation. Like you do your experiments, you find your uh, parameters that you want to train your model with uh, by using the training data sets that you extract from the feature store. And then you, uh, you develop your neural network, for example, if it's a neural network, you develop the model. Then in the end, what you want to do is uh, scoring and validation before you put the model into the repository in production. So it's important that you can, you have a model and you can also see how well it performed by using different libraries. There's a, uh, there are some, for example, TensorFlow extended, provides a few libraries for this. Uh, TensorFlow model analysis is one and validation also of the model. Once you're happy with the model, you can put it in your model registry, and then it can be used either by batch applications or deploy it in some model serving infrastructure, okay, but to be used by an online application. Now the model serving, as we discussed before, you can monitor it in real time for every request that comes in into model serving, and then the model serving would get the feature vector, the features that you need to use 
to send the prediction, the, the, the inference request, sorry, the inference request to the model. And you do that by going to the online feature store. If it's a batch application, you do it from the, from the feature store. Um, yeah, so that was mostly the, this is how the feature store fits in the entire pipeline. Now, uh, in a few minutes, uh, we will actually run, show the demo and with scikit-learn and to show how exactly that works with code. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually have, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? I actually have a question. So here for the uh, feature, for actually for, for the feature store, how do you, how do you choose uh, which database will be, will be lying on and how pluggable it is? I mean, if you, if you can play with different databases for, for the feature store. Uh, yeah, so uh, that, uh, so the, our choice was to go with, for the online feature store was to go with NDB and for the offline with Hive. But the thing is that uh, it depends on your needs and what we want to cover here online in real time and bots and, bots and huge scale, these are the technologies that fit best. Uh, in regards to the implementation, there are interfaces that you can implement and so you can remove, you can replace really both the online database that we are using and the offline hive. Then you lose the um, capabilities of the uh, consistent metadata. So the platform provides you implicit provenance, for example, that means that you have uh, provenance across all the stages implicitly. You don't have to wrap your code into different functions. But yeah, uh, if, uh, for example, someone wants to use some other database, uh, I don't know, Postgres or something, um, there's a dull uh, layer, uh, so there's an interface and you can, you can change it. Uh, so that's the good news. <laughs> uh, the bad news is that uh, the feature store is built on these now NDB and uh, Hive, but this is transparent to the user. Um, actually, bad news, I mean, you, you have to work to put some work to replace them, but you don't need to be, because this is transparent to the user. The user sees an API and then they don't know for example, the backend uh, specifics. But yeah, if someone wants to improve it or work or benchmark it with other databases, um, everyone is more than welcome. It's open source, so you can go ahead and do it. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so last slide, I think. Uh, so Hopsworks, yeah, feature store and ML pipelines, but Hopsworks is a bit more than that. <laughs> Actually, quite a bit more than that. Uh, especially, uh, for example, for training, we have multi-worker training support for TensorFlow. In the back end, we're using PySpark, but this is transparent to the user again. The user, they see uh, an API where they can provide their training function, and Hopsworks API will uh, automatically distribute that on multiple machines with GPUs uh, to accelerate training and to do parallel experiments, for example. So that comes with the platform, uh, open source of Hopsworks. So Maggi is a new framework developed in-house uh, based on PySpark to do hyperparameter tuning and parallel ablation studies. That means that you can optimize automatically, optimize your hyperparameters or perform ablation studies for the parameters that you set in the beginning when you want to, to find the parameters before you train your model at scale. Uh, also, something very interesting in Hopsworks is a project-based multi-tenancy which touches upon the feature store as well. So you can have within a single cluster, you have different uh, users and different, let's say, departments of an organization because they get uh, something, it's called a project. It, imagine it's like a workspace where you have your data, your code, and your users. So you can safely isolate, let's say, data between different projects within the same cluster or share data. So you have a feature store project, let's call it dev, and you have a um, production feature store and you want to share data between two. So you don't want to leak data, you don't want the uh, dev one to be able to read production, but you want the vice versa. And they, the production or the dev cannot copy data between each other. So you can do that by using the project-based project -based, project -based multi-tenants. And all the, uh, most of the services, since we have consistent metadata, adhere to this, uh, let's say, semantic, to this semantics. So we have Kafka topics that you can share between different projects and users and um, the feature store, as I said, uh, and data sets. And the last thing is implicit provenance. So uh, I, I touched upon it a bit before. The only thing I would like to add is that uh, different frameworks such as TensorFlow Extended, the effects here, or Databricks uh, MLflow, 
they do uh, more explicit provenance. That means that they wrap their code around your code and they track changes in uh, underneath. Uh, so they, so you know that oh, okay, I trained this model uh, by using this uh, this code and then this uh, data set or something. But we do this automatically from the file system from the ground up, and we do that by having a CDC API. We have another question here uh, from Marco Vasilevsky and she, hi Marco, greetings from Belgrade. Nice to have you at, at the webinar. So first of all, great presentation. Thanks to Alphilos. Uh, and the question is how does Hopsworth compare uh, with Zipline, Michelangelo and Feast? Pros, cons. So uh, Michelangelo, uh, yeah, I forgot to, very good question actually, because I, I, I wanted to mention that, but I forgot. So Michelangelo, uh, one of the main differences is that um, has a domain specific language API, a DSL. I think it is based on Scala. Uh, so in HopSorks, we use a data frame API. The reason for that is that we want to um, have it a more, a more generic API. So you're not bound to a specific DSL of a particular feature store, let's say. Okay. Uh, so we have a data frame API, and so it's more pluggable with different uh, uh, feature engineering frameworks. And um, what was the second part? <laughs> uh, so yeah, the second part was actually pros and cons. So just yeah, okay. Also feast, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah feast. So, uh, feast is. Uh, an effort, uh, I think it's a company in Indonesia somewhere that have developed uh, Feast, which is a feature store, but it's based on uh, Google, it's developed on Google Cloud, and I think it's uh, ba built on uh, Big Query and Big Table. So, uh, yeah, it provides kind of the same semantics in some way. I think they call it differently. I think they call it feature sets, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it's more tightly coupled with Google Cloud. Okay. Um, so that's one. Uh, difference and about the pros and cons yeah the DSL as we discussed and here we have the pro the multi-tenancy in terms of sharing across in the same cluster uh, sharing features uh, feature groups let's say and fit uh, not feature group the feature store of a project you can share it with another project so these are kind of uh, maybe differences I hope that answers uh, Marco's question. Uh, he'll write us <laughs> if not. Doesn't, yeah, he can write back. <laughs> yeah, and also I have another question from Ilya. Uh, can you define what are the typical companies that have benefits from feature stores that, that, that are actually mostly using it, like by size, type, stage? So that, that's a good question. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the question is good. I'm, I'm repeating myself here, but okay, if they're good, what can I say? Um, before, uh, when we presented the list of feature stores, so that's an uh, an opportunity to discuss that. Most of these hyperscale companies have thousands, tens of thousands of features, such as Uber, for example. So we're talking about the scale of terabytes or maybe petabytes and many, many thousands of features. Now about uh, specific verticals, uh, in banking, for example, that we work with, uh, you can have, uh, for example, some of our use cases, it's measured in tens of terabytes of uh, transactional data that then you uh, create feature groups from. And then you want to use that data to do anti-money laundering, for example. Uh, so that, that's one use case. Um, so uh, another use case is uh, for um, companies that have a lot of features uh, in terms of uh, users. Okay? So you have users and then in a betting uh, example, online betting, for example, uh, you have the feature store and then you want to compute features based on bets that people bet online or the to update uh, the games and the features of the games uh, continuously and all that but the idea is here that you you want to use the fit a feature store okay hop store whichever one you, if you have thousands of features to manage and the situation gets kind of out of hand and then you it's hard to organize it and keep track of the code that computes the features keep track of the storage, where the features are stored, and um, really to make it easier. So you want to make it easier for data scientists and data engineers to work on the stuff they, they like. You don't want them to spend time re-engineering every time uh, some code that computes a feature or searching for a feature, things like this. This is the main benefit, so, and the use case is that you want to reduce the time it takes and the clutter, let's say, for, all, for the entire pipeline. 
So uh, also, since we're on this slide, not everyone does that. So TSX, for example, TensorFlow Extended, they don't use a feature store. They, they have gone with the approach of an end-to-end -end pipeline where you embed the metadata in each stage of the pipeline and then you have the metadata in training and the same metadata you have a, an underneath database and you can access the metadata from every stage. The problem with that approach, and that I think answers also part of some of the questions, is that you have, as we described before, you have different uh, cadences for engineering and training. You might engineer your features once a day or maybe more frequently, once an hour, but training you might do it once every day or two days. So it's really hard to sync this up if you have one framework to do the entire thing as a, as a bulk, let's say. So the feature store kind of breaks it up in two pieces, so it's easier to organize. Mm -hmm. Well, that answers it, answers it for me, <laughs> and Ilya will write us if not mm -hmm. for him. So. Uh, so yeah, so we finished that. And if you are interested and you want to try it out, so as I said, it's open source, so you can download and install it. We have an installer script. It, it's installed all the services, everything you saw. Uh, it has a, its own install software. You don't need to see that. You just run the script, it's installed. Or more easily, you can go to hopsworks.ai, uh, where Hopsworks is, provides, is provided as a managed uh, SaaS platform. Currently only on AWS, but later on it will go also on Azure and uh, Google Cloud. And yeah, so license about the community version and some enterprise features that are not open source uh, because we also, okay, we come from research and we like open source and we use only open source technologies, but we have to make some <laughs> uh, money out of this. So some enterprise features here. Uh, yeah, okay. So if there are no other questions right now, I can jump into the demo and then we can go back to the questions. Well, Whatever you prefer. We can go with the demo and then we have more questions so that we can then answer them later. Okay. So let's see here. Yeah, I can log in. So I have set up an instance on AWS, for example. Then I will use my. Yeah. I logged in. So here is the landing page. Uh, on the right, you can see your projects. This is the workspace as we described. And these are just some in tools that you can click and uh, it will guide you through. So I created uh, some already for the demo now. So we can go to, let's say, demo deep learning admin. Okay. Uh, now we can go to the feature store first. Yeah. So here on the left, you can see a list of services. One of these is the feature store. And here you can see uh, the abstractions that we discussed previously. You can see a tab with the feature groups. You can see a tab with training data sets. We have only one for now. And a tab with feature search. So here we can search for features as, you, as we described before. We also have feature store details. So this feature store in this workspace has 27 features, has seven feature groups, the ones we saw here. And one training data set and some more metadata if you're interested. So let's go back to feature groups. So these uh, feature groups is from a data set for football games actually. So we have teams that play football, we have players, and we have games. About, so we can click on one of these, like the teams, okay? So we have a teams uh, feature group, an ID, a name, and everything. So more interestingly, we can click on statistics. So when you, another point of the feature store is that you insert your data into the feature store and then it automatically computes a bunch of uh, statistics, descriptive statistics and everything. So you can do your, let's say, data analytics before uh, you go into training. So you get an idea of the feature distribution or the correlation. So here we have feature correlations. So the team ID with the team budget, for example. Okay. Or we can do, uh, yeah, descriptive statistics. So the feature, the metric and the value, how many, features in this uh, feature group, etc, uh, etc, et min, max. And the feature distribution for, let's say, team ID. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> team ID is not a good example, let's go to position maybe. Yeah, because every team has different positions, that's why, but okay. Um, so 
So these are the statistics and then you can update them. So as you get more and more data into the feature store, you can click here and update the statistics. Here you can see, uh, you can view some more, uh, um, let's say details about the feature group. So if you want to go like low level, you can see the connection path to the feature group. You can see the actual SQL schema that comes with it if you're interested. Uh, online, okay, this feature group is not on, has, does not have uh, online enabled, that's why, like this. The actual job, so you want to compute the features. This, the feature store is not a database only. <laughs> it is a place to compute, where you store computed features as well. So if you want to compute them, as we said before, you can do it also in Hopsource or in some other platform since Hopsource can connect. So if you click there, you go to the job that actually computed the feature. So in this case, it is a Spark job. And then you can also uh, see it run in four minutes. And then let's see, I'm wondering why. You click here and then you get information about the, the job that uh, ran previously. So it's downloading a lot of stuff now, it takes a bit of time. Yeah. So here is the Spark UI, it's quite a big job that way. Took a lot of time. And also you get real time logs here with Kibana and all that. Now if we go back to the feature store, here are the training data sets. So in this feature store two, for example, we have one training data set. But uh, you can create your own, okay? So this training data set is uh, storage detail, TF uh, record format, but you can click new. And then you select the features that you want to include in your training data set. So for example, you want to include average player age and uh, uh, rating, something like this. So you have, you check out your features, you create your training data set, you give the name, uh, my, uh, training data set. Some description, optional. Uh, the format that you want to save uh, the training data set. Yeah, let's keep the default. The connector. So you can have more connectors here if you have created them. I will show you later and then create. So that will actually create a Spark job to compute the features. Okay. And then these are the resources. So you create it and then you run it. And last step, I think. Yeah. So how would you discover features? So if we go back here in the landing page, we see that we have two feature stores. Uh, actually, you can have a feature store in every project. Uh, and then I think we have actually in every project here. But let's say you want to see which feature stores have uh, the keyword team in them. So you go here and then you type team. And then you want to see, you want to say, okay, I want to search team in the feature store. So you do that. And then you get back all the, it's free text search. We, we're using elastic search for that. So we're doing free text search on the metadata of all the feature stores. And then we see here that, the, oh, okay, we found a, a feature group in this case called Teams Features with a description. It is in this project and some more metadata and how many uh, keywords were matched or something. So you can do the same for training data sets. So this training data set is using um, a feature called team, team budget actually. And then the features themselves. So these are all the features that it, it found on all these different projects. So this is a way to reduce, let's say, uh, to go back to a question uh, from before, to reduce time to discover and to reduce time for building the pipeline. Maybe someone has created some nice feature like churn. <laughs> so you would type churn here, you would find it, oh, okay, churn is in these projects and then Let's go back, not in this, yeah, uh, yeah, feature group. So here you can send a request and say, uh, go to this project or uh, I want to ask permission to be uh, invited to this project because as we said, projects are a multi-tenant. So what does that mean? If we go to, the, uh, again, to the feature store, here we have the members, uh, the members tab, so it's the admin, so the admin created the project, but now I'm with my account, Theo. So the uh, admin added me as a data owner and you can have roles, data owner or data scientist and all that. Uh, here's the Python uh, where you can install with Conda or pip libraries that you want and it comes with the default environment. So you have all these libraries where you can install new ones. Uh, that's mostly it uh, with, the, with the services in the feature store. Last thing I would like to show is what we discussed before about the end-to-end -end demo where you will, we will use the feature store as well to 
ingest data, uh, do feature engineering, build a model, and share it. So let's go try that. Mm, deep learning Theo. Go to Jupyter. So here we have these different settings. You can either run a few Python applications, but for experiments, we have some predefined settings for you, some defaults, you can change them. Uh, so we, let's say we do this one, and we start Jupyter Lab. Uh, you can also select Jupyter. So Jupyter Lab is a bit, bit more verbose. It's like an IDE, it's very nice. But if you want something simpler, uh, then you can go with the Jupyter Classic, for example. It will also load faster. <laughs> Uh, so let's go here. We have a bunch of example notebooks. So if we go end to end pipeline, uh, scikit learn, and then we have this example. So let's walk through it. It's a bit long notebook. So let's start. So what this does is um, we first do the imports. Okay. So we will train, uh, we will do some feature engineering and train a model with scikit learn. Uh, we start the application, then we want to load the data set. The data set is a CSV, I call iris.csv, is about uh, a flower, I think flower um, classification, if I'm not mistaken. So you have some uh, features, in this case features are um, things like the color of the, um, so let's see about the, what, what are the features here. Uh, yeah, here we have the sepal length, the width, petal length, petal width, and then you get back what type of flower it is. Uh, so it starts, and then we will read the data set here with Spark into a data frame. Then we will also print the schema. It takes a bit of time to start from the beginning. And then we will do the feature engineering. So here is a very basic example of uh, how to do, let's continue. This is a basic example of uh, doing some very basic feature engineering where you want to convert the variety column from a string to a number. And that will be our label. Also, I think we create here a new column as a lookup uh, to keep, uh, we do it later in the feature, so to keep track of which label is which uh, variety. So here we have, our, so here after we do that, we have our feature engineering. So this is Iris DF3, is our final transformed data frame, which we then create a feature group from. So we call it Iris DF3, Iris features. So if we go back here, now we see that, okay, we create the, feature, the two feature groups, Iris features and the lookup. So they are now here in our project. And I think we can also show the features, yeah, petal length and everything. I'm dangerously close to the shutting down <laughs> the zoom link. It's up there with the tab. Um, so yeah, we created that. Now we create the lookup as well, yeah. And then um, we did the. Uh, so here we read the training data set. Uh, we, we get. Actually, we get the feature group from the feature store. Yeah, I think that's because I created two times. Okay, we can skip that. I just clicked two times on the cell. So here we got the, um, the data frame back. And these are our numbers, our data frame with numbers that we want to use. Let's see, describe. Yeah. So these are our features. And now we're ready actually to finally use this nice feature engineered data frame and train the model. So we do this here, we've got an accuracy of 97%. And then we want to persist the model into, um, into Hopsworks. We have a, here an abstraction of models. So the very nice thing with, the, with Hopsworks and the feature store is that it automatically will tell you which model you have trained with which experiment, for example, and, with, um, and which notebook you used, which version of the notebooks as well. So we did that. Now it's time to serve the model. Okay. So in uh, scikit-learn, you would have to, uh, it's a bit more manual labor compared to TensorFlow, let's say. You would have to build your own iris, uh, your own classifier, and we we'll do it here. So there's a predict, and we have implemented the predict one for now. So you would have the model and then use the predict and then input the, the vector. So this is what happens here. And then, uh, yeah, we did that. 
Yeah, we'll run everything. And I can explain as we go through it. Uh, yeah, so we have exported the model and here we can see under the models we have all the different uh, files. So the pickle file, the Python object, is the actual model that was trained and we have the notebook as well. So I think if we go back to here. Yeah, if we go to models, we see Irish flower classifier. It is a model we, we trained, 97%, and we can view some more metadata. For example, where the model is and which experiment we use. So if we go to the model, we should see here the files that were produced, the notebook, the pickle file, the actual classifier, and the Python environment. It's very important actually to have a version of your Python environment as well. Uh, so we have uh, persisted the model, and now we want to send some to send some inference requests and also to monitor the request. So this is what we do here. We start. I think we started already. Let's see. Yeah. So we have the Irish flower classifier model serving. So we, we actually serve the, this pickle file with the Flask, uh, Flask Python server in Kubernetes by using this classifier that I showed you before, this one. So what you see here is running in Kubernetes. It has started already. And then we can see some logs or we can edit it. For example, we can add more instances if you want to scale it up and all that. And some info here. Yeah, here. So if you are a developer and you want to actually send uh, your requests through, the na through an API, you can do that. And this is the metadata for that, the endpoints. And to authenticate, you will use uh, API keys. So if you go to your settings, you go to API keys. Here you can create a new key like uh, serving. And then you can say, yeah, inference, resource store, and what project, and you create it. So now you have your key. Yeah, okay, I copied it. And you can use it from whichever application you want outside of PopSource. So if we go back to finish this example, here we see that we send the request to the model and we go back and answer prediction, which label this particular flower is predicted to be. And the important, here the last part is the monitoring of the model. So as we send the request through the through PopSource here, we send the request here make inference request. We uh, store these uh, requests in Kafka and uh, we also can read back these requests and print them. This is what we do in this cell here, 35. So we see the serving type, uh, the request was this one, the vector, and then the prediction. Okay, this flower is probably Virginica. Okay. And the Kafka one, the last thing, so where is Kafka here really? So I can show you. The multiplane field. Here, as you see, is a, a service in the project, multi tenant service, so you can share the topic, you can view some more information about the Kafka topic and the schema. It's compatible with the Confluent schema registry also, so you can view the schema as well. This is the schema that is used to store the prediction requests that go into the to model serving. So then you can compare all the, the statistics, for example, of the data that go uh, at predict at inference time with the statistics and feature data at training time. Because you might see over time, they might uh, drift apart. And that could be a time where you want to train the model again, for example. And the last part, okay, we did all this, like nice notebook and everything, but uh, what you want to do in the end, in production, is to split up this notebook into different sections and uh, run it uh, as a job. So if we go back to the, let's say, the I think this one. Uh, no, it is the feature store. Yeah, so for example, we have uh, an ML workflow here. Uh, it's a, a UI on top of Airflow to make it easier for people to develop their own uh, pipeline. So you will do uh, my pipeline, and then next, and then here we provide some operators like, oh, okay, I want to launch this job, this notebook, let's say, and then I want to, okay, this sort of job. This is the data engineering job, okay, stay. Then also I want to run some other job once this job finishes, so you have a success sensor. If it 
finish successfully, then create my training data set as we see here, and then run after the fits group job. So you save it. And then you generate the DAG, and you can see it here. So the DAG is really a Python program, this is how Airflow works, but this UI tool just makes it easier. It reduces the time to develop this whole thing and also reduce the errors that you might do uh, while doing this. But then you can go here and edit it also in place. Save it and then open it with Airflow uh, here. So this is kind of an end-to-end -end example of getting data, feature engineering, model serving, and orchestrating it with uh, Airflow. And I think I'm done with the demo. Uh, let's go back to the slides. And yeah, that's it. So that was Hopsox and the feature store, really. Uh, uh, it's open source, as I said. This is the link for the on the GitHub page, so you can uh, play around with it, install it. You can follow us, follow us on Twitter. And uh, yeah, we're very excited about the feature store. It's really catching on the concept. Uh, and yeah, okay, Hopsox feature store, but in general, we see from many different places and many different companies now are putting resources into developing and building feature stores. So that really shows that it, it is something here to stay. And it will. we see that it helps a lot to reduce the clutter and help manage all the feature data, in, especially in big organizations with thousands of features. Yeah, and that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Theo. It was a really great presentation. I mean, you all, we also have a really good experience here. So <laughs> thanks for, for sharing this. And uh, there are a few questions. Actually, I'll first start with my question <laughs> because I saw uh, you mentioned the uh, the versioning of the of the features. So is that also part of the feature store? Like, do you you also provide versioning of the of the of the features themselves? Uh, yeah, actually, I br I mentioned it briefly, but I did not uh, put a lot of details in it, so I can uh, say just just to think about it. Um, so version, yeah, so you can version your, uh, I can show it here also in the demo. You can version your feature groups. So if you go here, feature store, we can see here a version. So you can create a new version of an existing feature group. So that is based on your business logic, okay? Uh, you decide at some point in time to create a version, but there is also a need for something uh, that is a very, uh, a very fancy term called time travel, uh, that you can go back in time to get the feature data from within a specific uh, time frame, so you say, okay, I have this feature store here that we can see the games and teams, but in the back end we use uh, something called Apache Hoodie. Uh, it's an open source Apache project that provides you with, let's say, versions of your data over time. So you can do queries like, give me the data of teams features feature group from uh, I don't know, January to, to March 2020, or go back in time a few years. So that's very interesting. It's similar to what Databricks uh, Delta is doing, but we're using Apache Hoodie for that. Uh, they do it in a different way. They, they go down in the metadata layer, I think, of uh, Parquet files. Uh, so that's one, like versioning of your feature groups on demand, and you can version them with Hoodie for uh, time travel. But also you would like to version your code so for that, we provide, the, for example, support for GitHub for your notebooks. Uh, and also, we version the, the notebooks themselves, as I showed before, when you run an experiment, we keep a copy of your notebook. So you can go back in time, and if you want to rerun the same experiment, but with different data or different parameters. So that's the, that's the version in let's say, in a few words. Perfect, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Marco. Well, Marco is putting me here on challenge to, to read this. So. The question is, if data scientists are allowed to design the features themselves, after some time, uh, one have loads of features in the list that only guys who created them would also understand them. Can these features somehow be managed by uh, metadata asset management function of, of an enterprise by, for example, you using MS Azure data catalog, which all descriptions and links uh, that uh, describe the feature. Uh, in that case, the features could seamlessly be used in a self-serve data environment and not just by data scientists, but also by DevOps or business intelligence, for example. This would also support the concept uh, of having a point of truth for all product services a company can offer and develop. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that really means uh, hooking into external metadata catalogs, if I understand the question uh, correctly. And yeah, yeah so what... 
I'm talking about data engineers and data scientists, but really in this platform that you see here in the feature store, anyone can have access to it if they are given access, okay? We go to members and then you can have data owner and data scientist, and you can add more roles as well here, okay? So you can have more fine-grained access, access to this. Now, about the consistency of the features that someone developed a feature and then uh, after some point in time, the feature got forgotten on the, they forgot the meaning and all that. Well, you can use the description <laughs> of, the, of the feature group or the feature to, or the feature group actually to do that. And about hooking into, for example, Azure catalog. Uh, the thing with the Hopsworks feature store is that all the metadata of the feature store, of the file system, of the jobs, everything is on, stored in the same uh, layer underneath, in the same database to be able to provide provenance and all that. So theoretically, yes, you would be able to hook into some external uh, catalog system, but then you would lose some of the provenance capabilities that come out of the box with Hopsworks. I yeah, hope that answers you. the question, but we can do it follow up. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, two two questions that I'll put put into one actually by Valentina. So, do you plan to integrate some basic statistics dashboard describing the features, and also what are the big steps and challenges for for the future? Uh, the steps and challenges for doing that, or no, in general for for oh. general development of the platform and okay. the other plans for okay. dashboard. <laughs> Um, okay, let's go here, games features, uh, view statistics. So uh, we have these statistics for now. Uh, they're a bit basic. In the next version, uh, we will have a bit more, uh, we'll have them displayed in a better way, let's say nicer way, easier to discover and a bit richer statistics. Uh, but these statistics are really the first step to, uh, to discover the official group and everything. We don't have the, capability to apply your own code to generate statistics. You can do that by using a Spark job or something or a Python job, uh, but the ones you get out of the box are kind of uh, fixed, I think. Mm, now, about the challenges in general, about development, um, yeah, the, most of the effort is put into maintaining consistency of all and discoverability of all the feature groups and features, all the data that comes into this. Because this is where the pain point of most of the users that we see is that in really huge organizations when they have thousands of developers, they really lose track of all their, their data and their catalog. Yes, you have a catalog, but then as the question before said, you might have another catalog in Azure or something else. So, and by most of the effort and pain points and the development effort also is to make it easier to discover and manage the features across all these departments, let's say, of the organization from within the same cluster, if you want, and also split dev and production. Um, also, something I didn't mention in the touches upon the statistics is that there is support also for data validation, I forgot to mention, so there is a box here for data validation. So you click that, and then you have a total new validation. So we have some rules here. So you cannot validate the data that is in the feature store by using some rules, like I want the size of the feature group to be, um, you know, two and the max to be 10. And I want a warning for that. So we do that and then we, you can add rules and check out and we'll run a job and it will tell you. So in the back end, it's using a library called DQ from Amazon. Uh, because there are not really many data validation <laughs> and uh, libraries out there that can help uh, open source at least. Um, yeah, so this is about the statistics and the challenges. The statistics uh, really, yeah, we could uh, improve uh, in, the, in, in the future. It's something that we would like to, to make better. Perfect, thank you. Actually, I had another question, but I know that I can check that on Amazon. <laughs> I was thinking about what, what Amazon charging for managed service, so which sort of services are charged. But since we are uh, like, yeah, it's, it's 7 and 20, so like, maybe we should close this thing for, for today. Theo, thank you. Thank you a lot for speaking at, at our webinar. It was really a pre pleasure to host you. And hopefully, we'll have a chance once this crazy situation is over to have Belgrade on, on the one offline meetup, as I can call it, if I can call it that, to really talk about this stuff and really see where is the, where is the feature store and hops works. Where are they? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was a real, real uh, like privilege and pleasure. And uh, yeah, I hope. Next iteration will be offline in uh, 
somewhere in Serbia. I have never visited actually, I'm really looking forward. I've been neighbors also long, I come from Greece, so we're close, but I have never managed to, to visit. <laughs> so I hope uh, next time I will manage. Yeah, we hope to have you in Belgrade. <laughs> Thank you.